Gig Gab, episode 407 for Wednesday, December 13th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in cold Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Today, here in Santa Cruz, California, Paul Kent. How is Santa Cruz today? Lovely. Sun's been out. Just, you know, beautiful, crisp, blue sky days. Life is good up here, getting ready for the holidays. That's good. That's good. Yeah, we're getting ready for the holidays here. It's cold here, but, you know, that's just how it goes this time of year. It's, it's to be expected. It's to be beautiful. Snow on the ground? Uh, no. It, we had weird snow today. Like, like it, it, nothing stuck, and it didn't even snow for very long, but there were periods where it looked like a blizzard outside it, it, for like four minutes, and then nothing, and then another blizzard for four minutes. It's, it's New England. It's, you know, they, the joke is, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. And it's right. often true. So I've been in, um, well, first of all, I, before I get into, before I talk about me, thank you to everybody who sent, we have gotten so many emails, comments, text messages, Facebook message, all the things, an outpouring, I might even call it, Paul, from all of you folks about uh, it, the, the changes that we talked about with with Paul leaving the show, at least on a regular basis. And uh, if you didn't hear that, we talked about it in the last episode, but long story short, Paul uh, at the end of the year, your job is, is schedule is making it <laughs> such that you can't do gig gab on a regular basis anymore, but you'll be back on a regular, you'll be back on a semi-regular basis. And we've got some other things planned and it's, it's going to be great. But the, um, the outpouring of support has been uh, heartwarming, utterly fantastic. You, you, I have always said I would do this show even if nobody was listening, because I, I love talking about music and digging into music and it's a nice thing to quote unquote have to do every week but obviously you are listening and it's amazing so thank you for that yeah the notes that people have sent me have been greatly appreciated and I, like i always said it's, it's fun to me to hear from people because to me i'm just talking to my pal every week and then i'm reminded that oh yeah there's people out there listening yeah. but sometimes you get it reminded how many people out there are listening exactly and it's really really fun so the, the nice message is I try to reply to all of them. They're just greatly appreciated. I will be around from time to time. You can't get rid of me that easy, but um, the show's going to be fun. Nope, nor do we great. want it's to. New. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for saying that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it to, to be, I'm not looking forward to like, I'm looking forward to the, the challenge of, of what's ahead and, and the opportunities, right? Change brings opportunities. And so I will have to do different things with the show. And therefore I'm, I, I spent a little bit of time. I've no, I've, I have the benefit of having known about this for much longer than our listeners have, obviously. Uh, and you know, there've been parts of that where I've been like, well, what the hell am I going to do? And then there's been parts where like, well, wait, wait, I could do this. I thought this might be interesting. And like, so I'm, I'm really actually excited about what we have planned. So it's going to be fun. We've had great guests that are, are stepping up and saying, you know, use me more and, We've had different people. I was actually at a at a musician's party last night. That you, you remember, I started that holiday musicians get together yeah. several years ago up yeah. there. So so uh, a friend of mine kept it going, and it was last night. And I jumped in. I actually had two uh, Bay Area musicians say, "Hey, I, I heard about Gig Gab. You think Dave would like me to come on and, and talk about?" It? So I think you're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of people reaching out saying, "I've got a story to tell." And so you're gonna you're probably gonna have a lot of work weeding through the the and ranking the good stories that are coming to you I, in the future. And that's, I have that's already, a good problem to have. It, it is a good problem to have. I, I have already found myself like, cause I've, I've basically, you know, booked a few months out because I, you know, I, I'm a, I, I don't want to be stuck with, with nothing to talk about on the show. Right. So, you know, I've, I've started thinking about this and I've got people booked and like, I've, I've done all this stuff. And then as more ideas come, it's like, oh, I don't want to wait until April to do that, though. Huh. Yeah. What have I done to myself? <laughs> no, so, it's a good bump. Do yeah. you think you'll do you think you'll ever do solo shows? Like you'll have enough going on in your life and enough stories to tell that you're gonna want to do it yourself? So this is an interesting thing. Um, I have never 
there, there's there's an asterisk to this that makes what I'm going to say not entirely true, but it really is almost entirely true. I've never done a solo podcast episode, not of any of the shows that I like do. I did one solo like announcement for Backbeat Media years ago that was that I I released as kind of a podcast thing, but but in terms of like this show or Business Brain or Mac Geek Up, I've never done a solo episode. And so I, I and I like the I like having a a, a someone to talk to, a co host for a variety of reasons. One is it's nice to have a, a real time sounding board, you know, <laughs> to to like call me out or correct me like we do for each other, you know, or, or offer perspective or prod and ask questions and those sorts of things. Uh, but it's also nice to have a co host because it it forces me to do the show. Right. Like, you know, that it's like if, if I'm sitting on the couch watching the Bruins and it's like, oh, yeah, it's nine o'clock. I'm, I'm supposed to do the show. It's like, yeah, you know what? I'll do it tomorrow. Right. Like, that's easy to say when I don't have to call you and like, you know, remotely look you straight in the face and say, hey, I don't want to get off the couch. I'm watching the Bruins. <laughs> like, I, okay. I could. We could do that. But, you know, it, it, it's another level of of commitment. Um, well, I, I would just say this: you are the I king might. of gear, gear gab, and a and a whole hour of of stored up gear gab stories could be a really interesting thing. This is fascinating. I have literally told no one that that is my idea to do <laughs> gear gab solo, and I I was going to make it a surprise to everyone, but sorry, inadvertently. <laughs> no, this is brilliant. Like I I love that. That's this this is part of what I love about having a co-host. You inadvertently let the cat out of the bag. Yeah, I've I've been saving up some gear gabs, and so it, it's not going to be most of the time. I will have someone with me, but um, I I think there's a world where I I am going to experiment with gear gabs at times as a solo episode and see how that goes, and and we'll all see that how how that goes, and you'll let me know, folks. You know, it's always feedback yeah. at giggabpodcast dot com. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's really so, funny I've been that thinking you asked about that. something. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I mean, that's your sweet spot, man. So I, I just think geeking out on great music gear would be something that would benefit everybody. And yes. you're just super good at it. So go for it. Well, and it's, it, it, it is, and I appreciate you saying that because I feel like that's my comfort zone. So that's where I'm comfortable sort of taking this leap of, of doing the solo thing occasionally, which is, which is great. Cool. Yeah. 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 Good. yeah. All right. I've got a good, good topic for us to start on today. Okay. Ready? Yeah. 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 I've been thinking again about social media and I've been thinking about the coaching I do for myself that I would express to anybody out there listening is, and again, this is more Facebook, but it really, you know, applies to whatever your social media is, is if you are only using your social media to sell, you're doing it wrong. If the only way you are talking to your audience is by, by gig announcements or Ask him to buy a T-shirt, or asking him to ask him to do something for you. Yep, you're you're. I think you're doing it wrong. And and the the, the teaching moment is, social media is a tool for you to to foster, develop an audience. And the way you do that is, it's a two way exchange. Sometimes you give things just to give things because that's probably what you want your audience to think about. Is that you know. Oh, it's a fun place for me to hang out and check in on this artist that I like. He's not only he's not always asking me for tips or for money or for or for me to buy a ticket or for me to go see him. Sometimes you just tell a story. Sometimes you just uh, you know share a meme. Sometimes you, you know if you are so inclined, you record yourself and you share a song. And and I think that the the Uber message here is that. If you are looking at social media only as advertising, you're probably doing it wrong. It's not advertising. That's not actually what social media is. A lot of people use it that way. And, and the question is, are you overusing it that way? But social media as a, as a meeting place for you and your fan base to develop your relationship is the way that I think that, that uh, is the healthy way to approach what you're using social media for. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I we, there are things over the years that we have not seen perfectly eye to eye on. But this ain't one of them. I, yeah. I am I am totally with you. Yeah, it it has to be. It, you know, let's talk about it in ratios, right? You know, I would say at at like the worst, it should be you know eighty percent give, twenty percent ask. 
right? Mm-hmm. Like it, because you want people to it, want to engage with you. Look at what we do here, right? Yeah, we have sponsors occasionally. We have we ask you for things, but we don't start the episode and st- asking you for stuff and stay there the whole time. That would be exhausting for everyone listening. You wouldn't listen if all you like you would have no reason to want to listen. You we would not have gotten the outpouring of emails that we got from last week's episode if people didn't care about this show. And I don't think you would care about this show if all we were doing was asking, like, make sure you listen to the next episode so we can sell you the next thing or you know, whatever that is. So right. yeah, you know, so I think 80 20, maybe 70 30 if you're really good at it, but it's it needs to feel to your audience like you are giving far more than you are taking or asking or, you know, whatever you want to call the opposite of, of giving in this regard. But yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Social media is about being social. So think about how you would be in person with people. Would it just be, Hey, let me tell you about my thing. Hey, buy this for me. Hey, this, you know, I don't like no one would want to be around you and you wouldn't want to be around people like that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. If all you're doing is selling, you're going to wear the patience of your audience out. I mean, even it seems like uh, I'm detecting, and I think it's a good thing that more people are going back to maybe because it's winter time, but more people are going back to doing live stream uh, mm. shows. Right? I've seen more of that lately, but I also have seen advertising for log for for live streams that they're asking for the tips up front, like you know, tips welcome. I'm doing a live stream. Tips welcome. It just seems like if the premise is always, always, always asking, I just think you're going to wear your relationship with your audience out fairly, fairly quickly. Yeah. You can only get, you know, you, I mean, you have to think of it as a business, especially if you're literally asking people to pay you that therefore is a business. And you have to think about how, how much money is any one person going to pay you over the course of a year. Right. And, and, that isn't just directly to you. It's on your merchandise, you know, on your your songs or whatever art you put together that you sell. And then also on tickets, either for your live stream or for your show. What's that number? Come up with that number and be honest with yourself about it. I mean, you can probably look and say, okay, you know, here's my super fans. They come to, you know, 80% of the shows that I play And they always buy, you know, half the stuff I put out. So you can do the math and figure out what it costs them and throw in some extra for drinks because I know they come to your show and they buy drinks for themselves. But that's money at the end of the night that they say, oh, yeah, it cost me 50 bucks to go see Dave or Bitter Pill or Paul or whatever. You know, even if the ticket was 20, it's like, well, I spent another 30 bucks on drinks. So that's a $50 night. Think about what that number is. And then. I, d- don't ask people for more than that. Cause y- like you said, you're going to wear them out. Yeah. And, and again, the message is social media is not advertising. Yeah. That's, that's not what it is. You may, you may do some advertising in social media, but that is not what, so, what, and that's regardless Instagram, TikTok, right? I mean, there are ways, there are creative ways to cultivate your fan relationships, you know, with tip links and all that type of stuff. Sure. But if, if the if the main message they are getting from you is hey let's have another financial transaction between us you will you will wear out your welcome pretty fast pretty fast yeah give give some stuff quote unquote away it it'll it's, it'll yeah. come it'll come back I, I i mean that's my whole freaking life is giving stuff away and i'm still able to you, you know pay pay for my house eat. and my food eat. and eat yeah exactly <laughs> yeah the, the, i would say the more you give the more you're able to get it, you, you, it, you know, if that 80, 20 rule is the rule for whatever your brand is, well, okay, great. But if you know, you're spending four hours a week giving 80%, then th- th- if for giving your 80%, then that means you get one hour a week back, right? Well, what if you, yeah. it, what if you bring that up to 12 hours a week giving 80%? Well, that 20% is probably going to go up in proportion and that's a pretty good thing. So think about it that yeah. way. That you know, whatever whatever that ratio is, yeah, think about it. Yeah. I um that's that's good. I like this is good. I've been um I've been in a funk up until a couple of days ago, Paul. 
um, a, 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 a no gig funk, like not, not the good kind of funk, like the, you know, the bad kind of funk. Cause I had those, I had those two Christmas gigs with, uh, with Dave Bruniak with, with Dallas Corbin that got just randomly canceled and, uh, right. and bitter pills, not plan any this month. It, it, the holidays always kind of uh, disrupt that band and that's fine. And then also Billy and Emily are kind of in like a writing mode. So we're not even rehearsing. And so I've just been like, man, this, like this sucks. And I don't really have like an outlet, like, and I really started ki- kind of getting down. And then I, I don't know. It dawned on me one day. It's like, you know, Dave, you have um, like eight gigs between Christmas and new year's coming up. <laughs> Like mm. there's going to be a lot of playing because we'll do Rocky horror on uh, at the theater on Christmas night at midnight and new year's Eve night at midnight. And then in between that, we're doing five performances of Hedwig. So I guess that's, that's seven performances. Oh, you're on funk. So, Oh no, I, that unfunked me. So I, it, but it, it was, I, I don't know why, I guess, I guess I was kind of counting on those Christmas gigs with Dave to be sort of the, the, the buffer in between you know, our fall of, of like some bitter pill gigs and some other things and the, the Hedwig stuff that's like after Christmas. And so I, I it just, it just wasn't on my radar. And I was like, man, I got nothing. And I got to go to Vegas for CES in January. It's like crap, man. And then I was like, Oh wait, there's seven gigs in the middle there. Right. Great. I, I got people to play with people to play for like audiences and, and other humans to make music with. And it's like, Oh yeah. yeah. And I like a lot of those humans. Like it's, it's, it's not just like, any old theater gig where it's like, I don't, I might not even know everybody in the band walking into it. This, this particular band that we're playing Hedwig, especially with, but even the, the Rocky gigs, like I like these, I do those gigs because I like the people in the band. It's, it's like, it's a band that we've played, you know, it's the same people that have done this over and over again for years, even though it's been three years since we've done a Hedwig performance. It's like, Oh yeah, we get the band back together. Like I'm actually excited about that. It's like, right. That's cool. Yeah, it's, it's, I, um, but what it took for me and I, this, there's a running theme on this. It, what it took for me was deciding to sit down and play my drums. Like I got into this funk. I wasn't playing. I was just like, yeah, whatever. I'll just dive into work. I got plenty. There's tons going on work wise, which is a, a good thing, especially after a slow year. And it's like, okay, I'll just do that. And then I was like, nah, I, I got to like blow off some steam. And so I came up and played my drums. And it was like, halfway through playing my drums and I was like, Oh wait, wait, I have a bunch of gigs coming up. Like I, I probably have material that I should review because I haven't played these songs in three years, <laughs> but it, 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 it has always for me been that in order to make, and I know it doesn't actually work this way. And if it does, I don't understand why the universe works this way, but, but it sort of does where when I don't have people to play with, like on the schedule or whatever, I just start playing my drums by myself and then sort of, magically it 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 happens and it's like things just fall into my lap and so it's like all right great i don't know thanks universe it's a good thing yeah so we we got this email i mean we got a bunch of emails that we mentioned but but we got like a, a normal email too like a not a thanks for the show and you know we're looking forward to the future and thanks paul and all that stuff in the midst of that we got a note from keith can i can i read this paul please okay because i'm really glad that this came in this month, uh, because I I want to I want to get your take on this too. So Keith says I run a band here in St. Louis, and a few of my guys play in other bands. Okay, I was talking to a club that we play often and booking some 2024 dates, and was told by the manager that one of my guys approached him about booking another band. The manager didn't want to seem to understand that the two bands are mostly different, and said, "Look, I'm only booking one of you." You've been the one I've dealt with the longest, so it's your choice. Obviously, I told him to book through me, which means he's not booking, I guess, through uh, one of Keith's other musicians that, that reached out. Yeah. So Keith asks, Keith asks, have you ever been in this situation on either end of it as a, you know, the musician booking or the, the you know, band leader who's realizing this has happened? If so, how did you address it with your fellow bandmates? So you, I think so, you have, you've been, you've been close, you've been adjacent to this situation, I would assume with what you have with the house rockers and all this other stuff or maybe. Sort of. Yeah. Okay. Well, sort of. So let me start answering this in a, in a certain way. As I watch the conversations on the other message boards that are involved musicians, yep. it's always super interesting to me 
I I'm I think I'm in the minority of the thinking. There's there's so many times when the issue of my band member is doing this and it's pissing me off, where the responses are you don't own anybody, everybody can do what they want. That's that's music, right? That's that that is a that seems to be the predominant feeling, at least of musicians answering these types of questions about, you know, about what happens when people in a group have different opinions. Occasionally you'll see someone say, oh, there's a red flag. You know, you might want to make, think about making a hard decision there. But I, but, and but I, I tend to think, I, 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 I want to say, I don't think this is about that though. I am, as I'm from my perspective, like, yes, you don't own people. You can't tell them who they can play with and all, all that other stuff. But this is, it sounds like somebody literally leveraging an opportunity that that Keith created by having this person in his band and kind of doing an end around. It's not like he went to Keith and said, Hey, would you mind introducing me to the manager of, you know, club? What's its name so that I can, you know, book my other band. Like that didn't happen. This was, they just reached out directly to the manager because they were there and not got to know that manager. It sounds like from being there with Keith. That's different to me, but I, and now please finish your thought. Well, uh, let me see if I can bring it all around. So I believe that booking gigs is a competitive sport, right? So I, I just, there's a finite number of gigs and a, fi- and a, and a much more infinite number of bands. Supply I just demand. think that yeah. I, it, it is that. And so I often see perspectives that the act of playing music is that it, it it's, Everybody's out for themselves and that's okay. I don't see that, right? So in my mind, I'm trying to keep a band working. I've got, you know, nine musicians and a sound guy that if I don't keep them working, they're going to get busy with other things and go down. So so I am very focused on, on my band getting the gigs. It makes no sense to me that you're going to compete internally and that, that you, you know, you're there's plenty of competition externally that is going to be, you know, trying to get the gigs that you're trying to get. Yeah. I, well, you know, why, why engender a situation where the, you know, the call is coming from inside the house? I mean, it's just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So those are awful hard conversations. I guess to some degree that it goes back to like the most useful thing we ever tell people over and over again you start with clear communications about what it means, you know, to be in a band together, whether it's leader led or, de- or democratic, the principles of the band should be laid out and all these things should be laid out early. It's not always possible. So, you know, situations you didn't think of can, can, of raise course, heads, but, of course. Yeah. But, but I, I think the concept of, you know, the competitive nature of gigs is as a thing, you know, if you go off and do another band and you're doing the same the same repertoire and the same instrumentation. Is that, is that healthy for the, for either band? You know, no. So do you Uh, want to I don't think so. Yeah. I've never, I've never understood that. That's a really good point. Right. Cause I, I, I've made no secret of the fact that I play in multiple bands. Right. I like doing different things. I like playing with different people. Like there's, there's all kinds of benefits and reasons and, and all of that stuff. And then there's also the, the, pitfalls of it mainly the scheduling right like that's the that's the big one that i run into but i've never played in two bands that are doing the same material at the same time for the same audience the closest i ever got was when i was playing in sort of a general business cover band either in connecticut or here in new hampshire and also once maybe twice a year playing either in new york or San Francisco or Boston with you in the Macworld All-Star Band, right? Like that was the only time in my life that I've ever been a part of two bands where the material might actually be the same in both. Otherwise, it, it, but it was obviously two different areas and completely two different things. But that's the only time where I've ever, that, that's ever been a thing for me. Why would, I don't under, I guess, I guess to answer my question, why would people want to do this? If it's their living, if that's their opportunity to make money, you know, if you can go play American Girl five nights a week and get paid as opposed to one night a week, well, maybe there's a reason to do that. I, like scalability. 
I, I suppose. It just seems like it's a, again, a, not knowing any of every situation or what agreements people have in their different bands. Yeah. But with in the absence of any clear conversation about it, it seems like a bad problem waiting to happen. If someone feels entitled to, you know, and you want to be careful here because we're all, we're all borrowing from the originals if we're in cover bands, right? Yes. So we want to be care- careful about claiming too much, you know, authority over that type yeah. of stuff. Yeah, right. But, but, you know, if someone feels, at least to me, if someone feels like I'm entitled to do whatever I want, when someone feels entitled, that to me is going to be a warning flag versus having the conversation. Because if you just go do it because you feel entitled and you don't talk to the other people that you're playing with, you know, then everybody gets to start thinking about the, you know, where is this coming from? What does it mean? So the, I think I said this a couple of weeks, if you do anything in life that is going to affect someone else, be a good dude or, you know, whatever the female equivalent of a dude is. Be a good be human. Be a good person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be a good human. And like, you know, consider the the impact of something you do. I, to me, you know, entitled people are a red flag. You know, that's like, you know, it, it will, that, that thinking will raise its head and get in the way in a lot of different ways. But with regard to the original question, you know, I think, I think it's bad form. I think, you know, and I think it's up to the, you know, if the first band existed and has a client, yeah, you don't, it's a public gig, you know, whatever. But if someone just goes and goes straight to that booker and says, Hey, how about me too? Without ever saying anything, I, I mean, again, I, I'm probably going to get some mail saying they owe you nothing. I've heard that perspective. I get it, but I don't owe that person a gig either. And so if I, right. I don't like it, I don't, I don't have to put up with it either. Well, and, and the point being like, is that – so if you can scale and play American Girl five nights a week and get paid instead of just being paid one night a week, like that's great. But how many weeks are you going to be able to do that for? Right to your point, there's only a certain number of clubs. There's there's a fixed audience in a given area that's going to go watch you play American Girl. So, how many times you're not going to get the same person out five nights a week, you know, or even one night a week for five weeks? Well, you might because you might because the GB stuff is just so so common, and I think that there's a difference between the same audience. Though s- I don't know, man. Maybe. I mean that's, that's bar band music. It's the same bar band music, and so we. I mean, we talked kind of talked about the amount of yeah. overlap that there is. But I, I, I also think there's a difference between. Again, this is a, a a subtle difference, but it's a difference. There's a difference between someone you play with taking a gig as a side person to play similar stuff, versus versus someone you play with, like you started the conversation, leveraging the value that band A has made to create another opportunity for themselves in band B based on the, you know, like yeah. I play in this group. Yeah. I was just being <laughs> practical about it, but your point is like even being practical about it. I don't know that this is a smart business decision, but then there's the business and also just human decision of like, like you were saying, like, do we, do you, do you step on that relationship? Because that's that's short sighted, I would think. Well, it, it's short sighted to me. There, I'm sure there are band leaders who don't care, but if you're asking me, I think gig booking is a competitive sport. It's there's there's physics and there's supply and demand, right? There's yeah. there's a finite amount a finite amount of uh, of supply and or demand and infinite amount of supply. So I th- to me that's a big trouble situation that that is because again if you end up you know person b gets the gig and person a doesn't no longer gets the gig how on earth is person a gonna feel right i mean well and and how is how is club you know at club what's its name that 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 keith is talking about here like it was nice of that club owner to say to keith hey I'm only going to book one of, of you. You tell me which one it is. Right. Right. Like that tells me that there's a deep relationship there because if there wasn't trust between this manager and Keith, then the guy just would have stopped taking Keith's phone calls. Like I have plenty of bands. 
I don't need this bit of drama. Whatever's yeah, going exactly. on in that world, I don't want any part of it. Like that, thank goodness Keith developed this relationship. Otherwise, there would have been no email to send. It would have just been like, yeah, man, it's weird. We've been playing that club for years and now they don't want to book us anymore. Well, like, that's a corollary to the, you know, if you're going to do something that affects somebody else, if you're going to do something that creates drama, there are a lot of intended and unintended consequences, those types of things. It could make everybody look really bad, cause everybody a problem, yep. right? It, you know, it certainly is going to cause somebody a problem. And if you're banking, it's not going to be you, you know. Good luck. You're, <laughs> yeah, good luck. Yeah. I, we see that so I, 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 We see that in my podcast advertising business but with Backbeat Media, where, you know, we'll, if, if, Someone is represented, you know, we, we work not just with the podcasts that I do, but we work with like 50 other podcasts that other people do and we do a revenue share with them. Right. You know, we work on, we sell the ads and then we, you know, they do, they, they do the ads and we split the, the revenue. Right. There are other companies that do this where we're not unique. And I have been told again, because I have deep relationships with a lot of these ad agencies that buy from us and, and other people that buy from us. But I've been told sometimes by them, like, hey, you know, that particular show is showing up on proposals from three other of your competitors. They're like, we don't actually care. We just want to be on that show. So we don't care if we buy it from you or others. But we also have a policy where we don't work with shows that appear on multiple rosters because it makes it more difficult for us you know, we, we need to know that for show a, we're going this way and it's the only way it's going to happen. And we've been told again, because we have relationships, like either get them to figure it out or you need to drop them because you don't want them to make you look bad, right. but it, it does make us look bad. Right. Even when people are saying that to me, when they're, they're warning me, like do this so that it doesn't make you look bad. Well, I know it already is making me look bad, right? Like it's already happening. Just it's not going to make me look worse is what they're warning me against. And the same thing is true here. You know, if you well, I don't think I don't know, I don't man. think musicians can have it both ways. I That's think it, right? you, you either accept that it's a business and it's competitive and, you know, there is dollars involved and there's a finite number of dollars. There's a finite number of gigs and you have to conduct things in a way that that understands that premise. Or you're like, no, we're artists. Let's just let, we'll throw it out into the ether and let whatever's going to come down. Nobody owns anybody. There's no control. Control, you know, is is the antithesis of art. I mean, you, I don't think you can have both. It have it both ways. You either you either go out and compete for the gigs and get the gigs and you know you know keep your band working and keep your band together and all those type of things, or you you know leave it up to the wind and and let forces that you you are opting out of trying to you know co-op to your way and you you're going to get what you get you're going to get a band that probably breaks up if it doesn't work or you're going to get musicians that are going to have better opportunities i mean it, there there's all sorts of you got to get in there and run your business i guess is the point of it all yeah i i would um it, the to the people who think control is the antithesis of art uh i i would disagree with that um i think control is fine when exercised correctly or appropriately. I don't want to say correctly. Like there's only one way there's many appropriate ways. Uh, but I have been uh, listening to Getty Lee's new book and, uh, and he said something in one of the chapters that I just listened to that it's not control. That's the antithesis of art. It's compromise. That is, but uh, you know, that's mm. just, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it was that he was actually uh, re recounting something that Neil Peart shouted. In fact, at an, agency label um executive but you know whatever <laughs> but yeah whatever yeah it's a good question from keith and and i appreciate it because again you know i'm i'm i i face things like that from time to time and then you know i have to do what's best for my band and what's best for my band is not always to say no you go out and and do you and and uh and it doesn't it, you know even if it affects me negatively I, i'll just live with that i that's just not the way I think. Again, I, I probably will get hate mail for this, but I I I would say the predominance of thinking when there's a, a message about you know competitive issues or you know what what is what is reasonable band leader 
you know, what's the threshold of, of influence a band leader can execute more often than not. I don't know if you have the same observation more often than not. I see a very strong sentiment of feelings that a, a, a band is a, is an, is an at will thing. And if I choose to not to apply my will somewhere else, that's really none, none of your business. I, I can't find my way to that thinking. Yeah, even, even as someone who plays in multiple bands, I don't, I don't ascribe to that hard line of, of thinking. I mean, I'm certainly an independent person. I mean, look at this. I I'm patently unemployable, right? I, you know, I have to run my own businesses and all that good stuff. I, I get it. I, the independent thing works for me, but I'm also, but I like being in a band and part of that is and all that that entails and all that that entails. Yeah. Not just, and the expectation. Yeah. Yeah. Not just the idea of being in a band, but, but the, I, I like the experience of being in a band. I like collaborating with other people. And, but that means making room for them at, at at the expense of room for myself. Like that's that. And, and I, and even saying that it it makes it sound negative. It's not at all negative. It's fantastic. I I love it. I'm as much as I love going and subbing somewhere and you know shedding a bunch of tunes and going in and just slaying it and being the hero that saved the day. I I do like that. But that's that's over once you're you know you 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 fly out with your Superman cape on. That's it. You know. I mean, maybe you get called to do that again, and that's cool. If it goes any more beyond that, then you're in that band. Like suddenly now, you know, you're not the guy that's coming in to save the day. You're the guy that now everybody's relying on and you're relying on them. And it's a collaborative thing. And I really like that. Like, that's my preference is to be in a band. So, but you have to, with that, you have to understand that everything you do, everything I do, including playing in other bands, affects each band that I'm in. And I, I, I take that pretty seriously, I, you know, and, and it's, it's not always easy, but I, I, I keep myself in, in multiple bands largely. Well, I mean, I, I talked about it earlier in, in the episode that, you know, that no gig depression kind of thing, that no gig funk that I was in. That's what keeps me playing in multiple bands. You know, when I was on the yeah. road with hypnotic clam bake, I didn't have multiple bands I was playing in. In fact, I had to like leave the band I was playing in in Austin to go and do that. Obviously, maybe, maybe not obviously. I don't know, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, it, but I, think I, the, I knew that I had gigs. Said, there's a, yeah. there's, there's a difference between being a band guy and being someone who likes to play music or being a musician. They, they there are is a different difference. things. Yes. Yes. And, and also, uh, again, I you I do it a lot worse than you do. Be, you know, there are some bands where the construct is when it works for everybody to be together, that's great. And if we happen to get a gig and everybody's good, then we'll take a gig. You know, you know that there are so the temptation to not draw hard lines that the way you are seeing it right now or I'm seeing it is actually the way the whole world works. There certainly are situations where bands are have a construct of convenience that like, Hey, no pressure, everybody do what you want. And when we happen to get together. That's a beautiful thing. And let's just enjoy that moment. And it happens to be a gig. Right. But I, I, I don't know that that's, that's harder to imagine for me. If you're trying to, if you're trying to be an ongoing working band, right. That, I just, that's a harder yeah. construct to keep together. If you want to, if you want to go out, and 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 be a a often working a regular working band you probably need you know some regularity you know unless you're i guess you're the van band um you probably need some regularity in in the people who are playing and you probably want as few forces working against you as possible that i think that those are those are reasonable statements yeah if you want to be in, you know there's nothing wrong with being you know I love playing with these guys and whatever works out and we can all get together and play that Mac world Austria band, you know, that, that construct works as well for many people. But I think if you want to be an ongoing working concern, competitive issues are just part of your life. And again, I think that don't, why, why make it harder on yourself than you have to, and at least have, 
Because the flip side of that is, imagine a world where everyone in your band is as dedicated as the leader to making the band successful, right? Imagine, imagine if everybody was out banging on doors trying to get gigs. I mean, if you're a five-piece band, six-piece band, four, three-piece band, whatever it is, imagine if everybody was constantly trying to make that water go up. And then the flip side of that is, imagine one guy in your band who will give you his time and his instrumentation, but he's out, you know, really competing directly with you in other ways. It, it just seems like an untenable situation to me. I, I've been, I've been in the the first version, the Imagine a World, where everybody is is as committed, and and I, I maybe that's true now, um, as as I get older and play with people who have also you know, been around long enough to also get older because that's what happens with age is um, you wind up developing different skill sets. And so labor can be divided kind of like what Mike Schulte was talking about, right? Like in the, in that band. And I think it's probably fair to say in that band that they have, that they perceive that they have an equal commitment and an equal division of labor, right? In the pork tornadoes, at least based on Mike's perception of it. I, obviously the other guys weren't there, but it sounds like it, but certainly, you know, the band I was in, in, in high school and in college, uh, two different bands had that where it was, you know, we were all just like starry eyed and like, you know, all in and, and that's how, I mean, that's a pretty wonderful thing. It's hard to be starry eyed when you're also jaded, <laughs> I guess, but there are yeah. moments, there are moments where you can let yourself be starry eyed, right? Like, Oh, this is amazing. This is great. Wow. Look at what we have this. Is, and I think it's important to take those moments and just embrace them and acknowledge that you're, you know, old and jaded. Sure. And set that aside temporarily and just embrace those moments where you're like, wow, look at what we get to do together. This is amazing. Yeah, I know we have families and kids and houses and mortgages and you know all those other things, but right now whatever we're doing, this is this is what our focus, our collective focus is, and that's amazing. That to me, that's like one of the wonderful parts about being in a band is those those moments, whether they can be all the time, aka you're in high school, or they are you know compartmentalized, they still happen, and don't let them pass by without at least taking a moment to soak it in, in those moments, folks. I think so. I agree. Yeah. 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 I guess the question is, are you a musician or are you a bandmate? I don't know. Like like that's, that's kind of what we're talking about here. What, you know, the, the, the line and it's, it's, it's not binary, right? It's, but there's, it's a, it's an interesting question to, Pose to oneself and ponder. I don't know. That's what I, I got. I, for I mean, yeah, it was good stuff. It is good stuff. Thank you, Keith. I love these kinds of questions. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Uh, Thanks, Keith. Yeah. 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 You got anything else for today, man? I'm good, my brother. I'm good too. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. Thanks for. Thanks, Keith. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Thanks for sending that in. Thanks to everybody for sending in all your comments that we mentioned earlier. Truly amazing. Paul. Yeah. If you're a musician or a bandmate or something else, what's one thing we can all always do? Always be performing.